Thou wast transfigured on the mount, O Christ our God, revealing thy glory to thy disciples as far as they could bear it. Let thine everlasting light shine upon us sinners through the prayers of the Theotokos, O giver of light, glory to Thee. Hi there. My name is Father Thanasios Harris. I'm the Dean here at the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida. I'm your host for Be Transfigured Ministries. Welcome back to another free live online Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians inspired by the homilies of St. John Christum. Well, it's almost free. You had to sit through an ad today uh, in order to watch our Bible study, but we are in the middle of an ad campaign, a fundraising campaign, I'm sorry, to uh, defer and be able to eliminate all ads on our Bible studies. There is a donation button here on the Bible study. You can also go to our website at liveanewlifeinchrist.org slash give, and you can select ad, I think it's called uh, ad free campaign or something like that, so you can choose that. Or you can also make a Lenten uh, donation. We are in the middle of our annual Great Lenten Fund Drive. Our ministry is totally dependent upon your generosity, so we appreciate everything that you're able to offer to keep our ministry going. We have <clears throat> hardware needs every now and then, uh, and of course we have our website that does cost some money to maintain. In the meantime, welcome. If you're new to our Bible study, let me share with you how it works. We have a study guide, and you can find the study guide at our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org, if you have not yet downloaded the study guide. And there is also on the study guide a link, free link, to the homily of St. John Chrysostom. Now, we call them homilies, but they were really more like Bible studies in this particular series. Somewhere in the year 385 A.D., when St. John Chrysostom was a priest in Antioch. And that's beneficial to us because Antioch at the time of St. John Chrysostom, just like Corinth at the time of St. Paul, was very much like contemporary America. Highly educated, very wealthy, multicultural, and had a lot of divisions. So we're able to gain a lot of inspiration for our Christian life here in our contemporary American society. So, we are tonight, this is session 36, which follows homily 35, and tonight we are in chapter 14, verses 1 through 19. We are in the home stretch, the final stretch of our three-year-plus project. We started this before COVID, actually, so I guess it's a four-year project. Uh, we've been working on this for a long time, but we will finish by June. So I'm very excited about that. That's going to happen this year no matter what. Even if I have to sit here by myself in the middle of the night recording extra sessions, we're going to get it finished. All right, so if you are watching on YouTube, there is a live chat room moderated by Presbyteria Vasi, my wife, but you have to be on YouTube in order to participate in the live chat. So if you're watching it on our website, if you're watching it on Facebook or I still call it Twitter. I guess I got to call it X now so I don't get in trouble by Elon Musk or anything like that, right? Copyright laws. Copyright laws, that's right. But in order for you to participate in the live chat, you actually have to be watching on YouTube. So in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, if you click watch on YouTube, it'll launch an app or something like that for you. And you can then participate in the live chat. It is moderated by Presbyteria Vasi. Now, Normally, right around here, I go off and I talk about how wonderful she is and about how fantastic she is, and, but I'm going to turn over a new leaf. <laughs> I'm, I'm merely going to say thank you to her for moderating the chat room because if you have questions, she has a microphone. 
I know I take it my own risk giving her a microphone, but every now and then she uses it. And she will, <laughs> she, <laughs> she will uh, send questions over to the live chat. So, Presvitera, how many people do we have online right now? It says eight people are watching, but we've heard from Randall, John, and Denise. Cool. It was. I saw it. It's cleaning up here. Okay, now, Michael, it's good to have you. It's, it's, oh, see, Randall, Randall remembers last week's introduction. Michael, it's good to have you in real life, in person. Last week you were watching online. Tonight you're in the room. There are people in the room besides me and Presvitera. So if you're ever here in Tarpon Springs on most Tuesdays, we invite you to join us live in the room in Father Trifon Hall. And the tables are full tonight we may have to ask George to bring an extra table next week so all right without further ado let's go ahead and say our prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit shine within our hearts loving master the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments so that having conquered sinful desires we may pursue a spiritual life thinking and doing all those things which are pleasing to you for you christ our god the light of our souls and bodies and to we give glory together with your father's beginning and your all holy good and life creating spirit always now and forever into the ages of ages amen, amen. okay so we are 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 19. This is a long one. It's a long passage, and it's a long homily tonight. So um, we're going we're gonna to make our way through parts of it. As a reminder, it always helps to read it in advance, right? Sometimes two or three times to be able to get all of that, uh, uh, all of that nature. So who wants to read that? Do I volunteer to read? Do I have to pick somebody? Okay, I will read. I will read tonight. Okay, so chapter 14, verses 1 through 19. Huh? I think you should Next week has been candy for everybody. You can't just bring candy for through two people and expect the rest of us to survive the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 19. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies in great, is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by, by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even as you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you speak, that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? 
I pray with the Spirit, and I will also, I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Whew. Speaking of tongues, my tongue is tired. That was a long, that was a long passage. And it, he actually uh, goes through this twice in the homily. He really, he goes through the whole teaching and then he starts it all over again. So this is really a lot to, to, to capture tonight, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. All right, so a reminder for the study guide, you see the section numbers for the text analysis. If you're new, this is the traditional verse by verse analysis. And the section numbers are merely the convenience chosen by the editors of the homily text. So when you wanna go into the homily, you can find uh, where I am pulling these quotes from. And then you have what I call life application. St. John Chrysostom, just about always, sometimes one word inspires him, sometimes a verse goes into a teaching, a moral teaching we call life application here, then we will benefit us to live. Because even if we memorize the entire scripture, if it does not change the way we live, it is a useless exercise. So, section one, point number one tonight. Pursue love until you possess it. Never give up. Chrysostom says this, Where, Wherefore also he said, follow after, for he that is in chase beholds that only which is chaste, and towards that he strains himself, and leaves off, not off until he lay hold of it. Right? This was that difference between following after something and pursuing something. He wants us to pursue it because when we pursue something, we will not give up until we catch it. Right? Um, and so this is something that, that he wants. Pursue love. Don't give up. Point number two. The gift of tongues is lower in honor than the gift of prophecy. Wherefore also he said, follow after. Oops, what did I do there? Look at that. For some reason, I typed both things in the same, in the same paragraph. So let's just skip point number two. I don't have my, my uh, book with me, so I have no idea what I wanted to share there, but I'm sure it was very profound. Number four, I also talked about song. I'm sure it was very profound. I will endeavor, who's going to remind me to go back and change online the study guide and I can update it after the fact. Someone, all right, Seraphim is going to remind me. So by the time I get home tonight, send me a message and I will update point number two on the study guide on the website. So forgive me, but I'm sure it was very profound. All right, point number, and not, <laughs> not profound because I said it, profound because St. John Chrysostom said it. They don't call him the golden mouth for nothing, right? All right, point number three. All gifts are valuable if they edify others. Chrysostom says this, how everywhere he gives the higher honor to that which tends to the profit of the many. I love that because remember going all the way back, I don't know how many chapters ago when he was talking about Holy Communion, he's talking about the unity of the church. He's talking about using our gifts for the benefit of everybody, right? He's always encouraging us to use what we have to benefit as many people as possible. So that's the same whether it is the resources in worship or that is the same whether it's the spiritual gifts, right? So it's a beautiful connection that he's bringing together from weeks and weeks and weeks ago when we talked about the division in the church and people using their gifts either for themselves, which is selfish, or for the benefit of the whole church. So here he's saying the gifts are valuable if they edify others. 
Okay, so moving on to section two in the homily, point number four. The gift of tongues is honored, but prophecy is honored more. But rather and greater do not mark opposition, but superiority. So that hence also it is evident that he is not disparaging the gift, but leading them to better things, displaying both his carefulness on their behalf and a spirit free from all envy. I think that's important because in our contemporary understanding of things being different, we like to think that different means superior and inferior as opposed to just different, right? And so here he's saying, look, here's these two different, different gifts. One is superior, but that doesn't make the other bad. It doesn't make the other not good. It just means the other is more important. And why? Because it benefits everybody. Right, the other is a self-benefiting thing. This is, he keeps coming back to this self versus, versus many thing. Point number five. St. Paul's only priority is the benefit of the church. And these things he says to signify that he is seeking their profit, not bearing any grudge against them that have the gift, since not even in his own person does he shrink from pointing out its unprofitableness. Right? Just keep something in mind now that we're in chapter 14. Chapter 13 really was the pinnacle of this of this entire book, right? He goes on to love. It's the best. It's the greatest. It, you know, everything is, everything kind of peaks there. And now what you're seeing is his tone changes. He begins wrapping things up now in chapter 14 and 15. And you're seeing him start to bring all these things together. And constantly it is what? For the benefit of the church. Okay, so you're going to start seeing him talk about church more. And remember, he's speaking to an entire congregation here, entire community, which is divided, which is highly educated, which is multicultural, which is wealthy and poor and all that kind of diverseness, right? Um, and so all of it is always to benefit the church, not himself, not the apostles, but the church. And who was the church, of course? is the body of Christ. So there's all those connections going on there. Point number six. St. Paul expresses humility in acknowledging that he has no value if the people do not benefit. Right. So now there's this interesting co connection here. And what he means is, if I say not somewhat if I say not somewhat that can be made intelligible to you, and that may be clear, but merely make display of my having a gift of tongues, tongues which you do not understand, you will go away with no sort of profit. For how should you profit by a voice which you understand not? Right? So, and I think we talked about this a couple sessions ago. This question, we're talking about languages here. We're not talking about that unintelligible, what the Pentecostals talk about, the gift of tongues today, right? So, and you'll see more and more of that as we're kind of wrapping up uh, in Corinthians. But here, St. Paul is talking about languages. And so, being able to understand what is being taught. Edification is key, not merely holding yourself up to some kind of, hey, look how wonderful I am. Look at these great gifts that I have. Do you have a question, Philip? No, I was just, just going, going to add, in, in case, case anyone, anyone doubted, doubted that, that it does in fact, fact mean languages, languages that, that are real and actually, actually exist and, and not just psychobabble. Psycho St. John Chrysostom clearly indicates that that's what St. Paul means in his... Uh, yeah, he does. Policy. Now, he speaks of the Persian and the Roman and, and the Indian and many other tongues, which is a clear indication that he and his contemporaries viewed it as languages, not Correct. Now, I will say, I 
if I get if it's in here I don't remember I did reach out to my professor of the New Testament because I know that there is you have to understand there is in fact an understanding in the church that St. Paul at times did recognize there was this other somethingness there was this other spiritual language that was being referred to sometimes okay so we do understand that there was this something that no longer exists in the church that sometimes St. Paul was talking about okay that's not the case here and clearly Chrysostom is under the opinion that he's talking about different languages, right? And that is also referenced because of what takes place in the book of Acts, where they specifically talk about the different languages of the world and stuff like that, okay? But just understand that we are not suggesting that some kind of spiritual some people call it angelic language. We're not saying that does, didn't exist, but it's not what's being talked about here. Okay. Um, and so it's not what the Pentecostal church talks about. And for confirmation, I did speak with a, a friend of mine who is a Greek Orthodox priest who is a former Pentecostal minister, and he said it is absolutely gibberish. Um, they actually are taught key phrases and things um, within, within their tradition that it's not, it's not this uh, charismatic thing that is going on. They're actually taught various phrases and things to speak. So it's clearly not what St. Paul was referring to in terms of this angelic language. So I always, I always have to clarify that we are, we are definitely uh, understanding that there that there was this different thing but that's not what's being talked about here okay where are we number seven. point number seven section number three if inanimate objects require order to be of value how could we expect less of living human beings <laughs> Chrysostom is, is pointing out just how beautiful St. Paul's work is here. How many times we've seen this over and over, St. Paul turns to the created world to show the wisdom of God, right? And again, although this is not a class about creationism or whatever, how anybody could see the beauty of the created world and not see God in that? Right? So here, even in the question of gifts and languages and interpretations, St. Paul's turning to the creative world saying, look, even if these musical instruments did not have order, no one would know it was, they would be useless, right? A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the clanging cymbal, right? This nasty clank, clank, you know, not the beautiful, you know, brass bells, but this clanging, clanging sound. So let's hear what he says here. Now, if from things without life we require so much distinctness and harmony and appropriateness, and into those inarticulate sounds we strive and contend to infuse so much meaning, much more in men endued with life and reason and in spiritual gifts ought one to make significancy an object. Isn't that pretty cool? Of course, being a a musician, I tend to appreciate the musical instruments connection, right? Um, there was a, a professor, this is a very, very broad tangent about musical instruments. One of the very first days of college, I got my degree in music, and our professor challenged us to come up with a definition of music. And keep in mind, I went to school in the late 80s, early 90s, so some of you were not even born yet, I understand. Um, but in contemporary music, St. Paul was not talking about contemporary music, because contemporary music is absolutely a combina combination of random sounds <laughs> sometimes. It is not necessarily any kind of distinctness. We even had one uh, one piece that we were playing that the composer uh, in the percussion section had called for 
tuned terracotta pots. And so the percussion section had to go to the garden center and take different flower pots and like take their mallets and say, well, which pitch is which pot hanging? And they had the, the, all these different pots with different pitches, right? But what made it music was it wasn't just clanging pots. They took the time to make sure each pot played a particular pitch. It was really kind of cool to see these guys playing these clay pots and it was beautiful, beautiful music. But I digress. Oh, that's a message. Yes. So, but your, your red light's not on. Wiggle the, wiggle the stem a little bit at the bottom. There you go. So, I just wanted to clarify some of the um, conversation on the chat room says that having a Pentecostal background, they do agree. And um, Randall says as a child, they forced us to bow before leaving. Oh, really? They practice, they practice babbling. They practice babbling, right? So, if, now, back to the current Pentecostal church. In my looking this particular topic up, I was challenged to be respectful of the Pentecostal church. Not because of what they're saying in their babbling, but to not be so quick to cast somebody aside who is in fact believing and talking about Christ. That th there is some level of respect, not necessarily that what they're doing is what St. Paul is talking about, right? But that we shouldn't be so quick to cast off people who are talking about Christ. They might be wrong in what they're teaching and they might be misled in their beliefs, but they are talking about Christ, right? And so what does Christ say? Those who are not against us, right, are for us. And so there is something to be said about a certain level of respect for anybody who preaches Christ. Even if what they're teaching is not correct, it doesn't mean they are to be belittled, we should be encouraging them to come back and correct their beliefs as opposed to belittling, belittling them. But it is, I feel vindicated now that Randall confirmed he was forced to learn to babble. So let that be straight from the Pentecostal's mouth, right? He was forced to learn to babble. What does babble sound like? Uh, like so, uh, no, don't get on YouTube. But I, I, here's how it was explained to me. Has anyone ever been to a real auction house? Oh. Where the auctioneer, blah, 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 if you don't know what he's saying, it sounds like complete gibberish. But they're actually saying actual words. And they're taught they're taught phrases and they're taught sounds to use and it's actually it's like an auctioneer's language okay and it's really just to get the excitement going the same way pentecostals are taught these little expressions and these little sounds that's the the the, the, the i call it gibberish right it's not me they're not meaningful words they're not actual words they're sounds and they're expressions and they're taught to run them off their lips as if they're actually saying something and, and randall confirmed they actually forced to do it before they left that's interesting okay moving on okay. point number eight anything that does not help our salvation is useless which is just what he means and the mischief of it, what he is manifesting when he says, who shall prepare himself for war? So then, if, if it have not this quality, it is the ruin of all. And what is this to us, says one. So if it's not bringing us closer to our salvation, it's not useful, okay? Now, again, 
like he says, tongues versus prophesying. It's not that it's necessarily bad. Something that is not useful is not necessarily detrimental, right? And I think this probably is the nice conversation when we talk about idle talk and we talk about, you know, do we always have to be speaking something for spiritual edification. Some people think that if we're not speaking something spiritual, that's the same as idle talk, as if we can't just sit and chat about the weather. Okay, obviously chatting about the weather has nothing to do with our, our salvation. So in the context of this, we're not gonna be going into the church and wasting our time talking about the weather. But that doesn't make it idle talk either, okay? But here he's talking about, if it, doesn't edif if it doesn't bring us closer, how did I write it? Anything that does not help our salvation is useless, okay? Just, we don't have to waste our time doing all that stuff. Point number four. The gift of tongues is meant to draw people together. And I think this is where... Uh, even at the level of the modern Pentecostals, this is where my uh, professor was kind of cha challenging me, right? That if it brings people to talk about Christ, then we can take it from there and kind of inspire them into a correct believing about Christ. But of course, this is something different here. Let's see what Chris Islam has to say. Wherefore, he everywhere points out its imperfection, that so he may bind them together, and how he that accounts it to be sufficient for itself does not so much commend it as disparage it, not suffering it to shine brightly by the interpretation. For excellent indeed and necessary is the gift, but it is so when it has one to explain what is spoken. So again, he's not saying it's bad, it is only helpful if there's an interpretation, if it's bringing people together. A few weeks ago, I think he talked about how, uh, how love draws people together and how he talked about the poor city and the, and the wealthy city. Was that last week? I don't remember. A couple, a couple sessions ago where the, the, the financial disparity draws even cities together. So that was last week. Okay, thank you for keeping track of those because I, I, my mind is all, all in different places. Right, so that in the same way, the gift of tongues is drawing people in, the benefit then having been explained as opposed to just kind of rambling out there. Point number 10. One additional thing about benefiting each other. When a gift is kept private, we remain foreigners to each other. But do thou, I pray, consider how everywhere he has given diligence to free the gift from censure and to bring round the charge to the receivers of it. For he said not, I shall be a barbarian, but unto him that speaks a barbarian. And again, he did not say that he, that, that he that speaks shall be a barbarian, but he that speaks shall be a barbarian unto me. Right? So there's that, there's that separation without the explanation. Okay? And this is where he's saying the tongues are meant to draw us together. I say something in a language and then I interpret to draw us together. Otherwise, it's just foreign. We, we, we aren't drawn, if we're not drawn together, then we have no unity. We have no unity, we are not Christ. Do you see how all that kind of, it's piling now. Again, there's that culmination as we're, as we're rolling up the, the end of the, the, the book. Section number 5.11. St. Paul wants us to possess gifts so much, but only if the church benefits. And, and by the way, this is referring to where he says, um, but I wish you had the greatest gifts of all, right? He's, he, this is where he's referring to that. Thus, so far am I from wishing you not to possess them, that even I wish you abound in them, only so that you handle them with a view to the common advantage. 
right? So he wants us to have all these things, but so long as the church benefits. He doesn't want us just the sake of having them, right? And I think, because Chris is down talks, I, I posted today uh, a quote. I've been working a few, a few sessions ahead. So I was in homily 40 today. No, I was, yeah, homily 40. And he says that the wealthy cannot become wealthy without making the poor poor. Right? Because there is a finite amount of wealth in the world. And for someone to have a lot, that means someone has to have just a little. Okay? Now, he talks about wealth disparities all the time. But here, again, it's not that that wealth is bad. It's that wealth not used for others is bad. It's not that these spiritual gifts are bad, but the spiritual gifts kept to ourselves are useless exercises. He's going back to that selfishness again, as opposed to the sharing, as opposed to the act of love. Remember, we just came off everything about love, 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 love. So he's going to hammer that back on now, saying, look, it's for, it's for other people. Point number 12, section 6. This is where, again, he starts repeating different parts of the, of the homily here. If others cannot understand your prayer, it only helps you. Now, before we get into this, remember, there's two types of prayer, right? Personal prayer and corporate prayer. That personal private prayer is what we pray in the privacy of our home in front of our icons. Corporate prayer, that prayer we do together in the church, is not just for me. It's for all of us. That's what he's talking about here. So let's see what Chris Islam has to say here. And what he says is this. If you shall bless in a barbarian tongue, not knowing what you say, nor able to interpret, the layman cannot respond the amen. For not hearing the words forever and ever, which are at the end, he does not say the Amen. Then again, comforting him concerning this, that he might not seem to hold the gift too cheap, the same kind of remark as he made above, that he speaks mysteries and speaks unto God and edifies himself and prays with the Spirit, intending no little comfort from these things. I'm reminded, by the way, that there is an actual canon that prohibits saying amen to a prayer you did not hear or understand. Right? Because what is the amen? It is our statement, our declaration, let it be so. Yes, I claim ownership of that. Yes, I'm in agreement. Well, if it's in some foreign language, how can we say we are in agreement? Now, before you get into the whole Greek versus English thing, right? That's why we have the books in front of us so that when we're going back and forth, because we, are, we happen to be a bilingual community, those who do not speak Greek can see in English what I'm saying, and those who do not speak English can see in Greek what I'm saying. And there are people of both sides within our, within our community. So don't be quoting that particular canon to me on any given Sunday, because we are not worshiping in ignorance. We actually have the text in front of us. Okay, um, but this is something the church takes very seriously. It would be a more serious situation if, in our case, for example, if we did not have liturgy books for people to be following what in fact is being said on both sides of the language perspective, right? Because you can't say the amen if you don't know, what's, if you don't know what is being prayed. Not a case when you're sitting at home privately in front of your icons. You can pray whatever, whatever language you know. Section 7, point number 13. St. Paul never puts himself above others. Further, because he had run down the possessors of this gift as though they had no such great thing, that he might not seem to hold them cheap as being himself destitute of it, see what he says. I thank God, speaking with tongues more than you all. And he does this also in order, 
in another place intending namely to take away the advantages of Judaism. In other words, he's, he's kind of, St. Paul does this a lot where he'll speak in extremes to make a point. So lest someone say that speaking in tongues is bad, he will say, I speak in tongues better than anybody. But that he's not saying that that makes him better than everybody. He's merely using that so that people don't accuse him of saying that speaking in languages is a, is a, is a bad thing. That, that's, he's, that's a very typical uh, tactic, not easy to say. Uh, a very common trait of St. Paul in his teaching. Okay? And this, of course, wraps up our, uh, our uh, analysis. Vain glory is the, is the problem, and that's going to lead us into our life application. Wherefore, neither did he employ it, not because he had it not, but because he always sought the more profitable things, being as he was free from all vain glory, and considering one thing only, how he might render the hearers better. Right? How many times have we seen St. Paul say, I'm speaking to you now in human terms. Right? He will use whatever opportunity he has to get his point across. And it doesn't mean in that one moment, you know, like, uh, was it two sections, two sessions ago when he was he, saying, look, I'm the same as the apostles. He was not lifting himself up and providing himself. He was merely using it to teach that what he says is what they say and all that kind of thing. So he is not a vainglorious uh, kind of guy, but he uses these different techniques so that people don't accuse him of, you know, disparaging everything. It is really a very well crafted and well done. So that's leading us now to our life application. So our, our life application, if you're new, again, I said that this is launching from something, in this case, this humility of St. Paul. And so I've titled it Vainglory is your enemy. Run away from it. Boo, bad. Ooh, boo. Okay. I have it on the screen, so if you're watching at home, you don't have to be digging for it. Vainglory blinds you to sin. This is why it's so dangerous. And here is the reason of the faculty he had of looking to the expedient both to himself and to others, vis-a-vis, -vis, because he was free from vainglory, since he assuredly that is enslaved by it, so far from discerning what is good to others, will not even know his own. Right? When we're so consumed with how amazing we are, I mean, right, let's face it, I'm, I'm an amazing guy. You're supposed to help me keep me humble now, come on. No, you're the worst. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but no, in all sincerity, this is, this is what he's doing is our, va our vain glory makes us blind to our, to our weaknesses. And when you're blind to sin, then you're not trying to stop it. That's the key. Right? Remember, all of us are going to sin. He talked about this, I don't know, a few months back where he says, look, it's not paying attention to the sin that gets us in trouble. So if we're blind to it, that's even worse than not paying attention because when we're blind, we don't even know what's going on and we stay in our sin. That's the danger. That's the danger of vainglory. All right, next point. <laughs> Fake humility, thank you very much, is still vainglory. By the way, I have a footnote there uh, where he says, not like him of Sinope, this is believed to be Diogenes. And so there's a link there in the study guide. You can read a little bit about who that person was. Who clothed in rags and living in a cask to no good end, astonished many, but profited none. 
Whereas Paul did none of these things, for neither had he an eye to ostentation, but was both clothed in order, ordinary apparel with all decency, and lived in a house continually, and displayed all exactness in the practice of all other virtue, which the cynic despised, living impurely and publicly disgracing himself, and dragged away by his mad passion for glory. In other words, this uh, this cynic, this Diogenes, he pretended to live a humble life. Huh? Yes. Right. So, if you look, I put, I found the little thing there on Wikipedia that you can go back and read if you want a little bit about what he's talking about there. And I think what's so cool about that is just these different things that. And you'll see that in the next few, next few sessions as well, where St. John Chrysostom doesn't lit him, limit himself just to what St. Paul's saying. He's giving himself some other history, giving us some other history context, not only his history, but his contemporary context. So there's a, a great example, right? So fake humility is still vainglory. Next point. Imitate the saints to defeat vainglory. By what means then may one find a remedy for this manifold distemper? By bringing forward those who have trodden it underfoot with an eye to their image, so ordering one's own life. So I just want to pause there for a minute because our tradition in orthodoxy Every day we commemorate a group of saints. And Yesterday we and commemorated almost everybody. Because it was April Fool's Day. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. The stare was great. Huh? Uh, thank God your microphone was off for that one. <laughs> uh. I'm typing in for the people. Um. I lost my train of thought now. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. In our tradition. Thank you. Every day <laughs> we commemorate the saints, but not merely so we know this unnecessary list of names, but that their life can inspire us. Okay, and that's why we read the lives of the saints, because these are the saints the church says imitate their life. So if we want to get rid of vainglory, imitate the lives of the saints that we read about. Okay, uh, it, really, it really is helpful. It really is helpful. Okay, next point. Genuine humility is willingly rejecting glory. Consider, I pray, this same apostle who speaks these things, how he ever ascribes the whole to God, how of his sins he makes mention continually, but of his good deeds never, unless perchance it should be needful to correct the disciples, and even if he be compelled to do this, he calls the matter folly and yields the first place to Peter, and is not ashamed to labor with Priscilla and Aquila, and everywhere he is eager to show himself lowly, not swaggering in the marketplace, nor carrying crowds with him, but setting himself down among the obscure. Right? That's very different than Diogenes. It is this genuine humility, and he's rejecting glory. Right? I talk about being John the Baptist, right? What did John the Baptist do? He kept telling everybody, no, it's all Christ. Look at Christ. Follow Christ. What does St. Paul teach us? Accept all blame and deflect all credit. Right? But it's, it has to be genuine. It has to be genuine. Now, there can be an opportunity to train ourselves in humility. The old adage, fake it until you make it. If we are deflecting glory, even if we want glory, 
so long as we're deflecting it because we're trying not to want it, then it's going to benefit us. Does that make sense? What Chrysostom is saying here is don't waste time deflecting it so that you can be... Look how wonderful he is. He never even takes the glory. That's not the same thing as, man, I really want the glory, but the only way I'm going to learn not to want it is by always refusing it. Because now I'm making a concerted effort to change my heart. Does that make sense? That's what Christophe is talking about here. Genuine humility is in rejecting the glory. Even in those moments when we, want the, we are so desperate for the glory, as long as we're doing it to teach ourselves to not want it. And that's where the struggle comes in because it's got to be genuine from our heart. All right, next point. Point number 19, section 19. Being afraid of insults is also vainglory. This was a fun one for me. But the men of our time are overwhelmed by all things, not by desire of glory only, but also, on the other hand, by insult and fear of dishonor. Thus, should anyone praise, it would puff you up. And if he blame, it would cast you down. So being afraid of insults is just as bad as wanting glory. Right? And I, I just, it, that is so un-American. <laughs> it is so un-American in a society where we're all about presenting ourselves and puffing ourselves and look at my 17-page resume, how wonderful I am, and all that kind of thing, right? That's one element of vainglory. But, oh, if somebody says something bad about me, I'm really destroyed. That is just as bad. And that's what Christom is saying here, right? And the example for St. Paul. St. Paul never is afraid to admit his failings because it keeps... It keeps us in a, in a good place. So that's pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. Next point. A balanced heart defeats vainglory. Knowing therefore these things, let us not shun poverty. Let us not admire riches, but prepare our soul to be sufficient for all estates. If I remember the 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 full homily a little bit better. He really goes into this relationship between wealth and poverty, right? And it's that we have to understand that there is a balance to life, right? And so don't shun poverty and then don't chase wealth. At the same time, um, you know, we know that we can't we, we can't all be poor. We can't all be wealthy. So there's this understanding and this need for balance that is so important. Okay, next point. Be prepared for poverty and wealth. Wherefore, letting alone these things, let us render our soul meet both for wealth and poverty. For although no calamity such as man is subject to befall, which for the most part impassable, even thus, better is he that seeks not wealth, but knows how to bear all things easily than he is as always rich. So, I think what at least what I'm getting from this particular point is, is that it's important for us in, in terms of our state of mind, in terms of our vainglory, to be prepared for both realities. Okay? Because either we're going to desire wealth for the sake of wealth, now we've lost Right? But at the same time, what if we're blessed? 
What if we do become very successful? We have to be prepared for that. We have to know how to handle that. We have to know, even, I, I pointed this out, I don't remember when, uh, I don't remember if it was in here or where it was, but even in the wedding service, did I say that last week? Yes. Where we, thank you very much, where we pray I'm gonna, for. I'm gonna skip next week and just come the week after. Thank you for feeding yourself. <laughs> where we pray for an abundance of blessings, so that the couple can help other people, right? So we have to be prepared for blessings, but we also have to be prepared for poverty. Otherwise, both will defeat us, right? So that's, to me, how, uh, how we kind of get through some of that. All right, now this is where Chrysostom really just kind of drives the point home. Wealth tortures us even in death. <coughs> this whole section of the homily was really, uh, really interesting. Not even when dead is he freed from the villainy of the robbers, nor has death power to set him in safety. But the evildoers despoil him even when dead. So dangerous a thing is wealth. For not only do they dig into houses, but they even burst open tombs and coffins. What then can be more wretched than this man, since not even death can furnish him with his security? But that wretched body, even when deprived of life, is not freed from the evils of life. Those that commit such wickedness, hastening to war even with dust and ashes, and much more grievously than when it was alive. I mean, not only is that such a well-crafted section of the homily, when he talks about the grave robbers and the, the desecration of the graves and the tombs and the bodies and leaving the bones, that, but it's only useful because we imagine how painful it will be for our bones to be desecrated. And we wouldn't even feel that way if we didn't recognize that there's more to life than now. I mean, that's really not at all what this part of the homily is about, although we're going to get to it uh, when Chris is not, when St. Paul talks about the resurrection. and the, the. But think about this for a moment. If we lived life thinking that all we have is today, and once we're dead, no big deal, everything's over, everything is good to go, then this talking about our bodies and our graves being desecrated wouldn't hurt us to hear at all. But because our mind does imagine that, and because we do place ourselves in that, now it scares us. Oh, wait a minute. Even in death, I'm going to be tortured by wealth because they won't leave me alone. I remember this one time in Denver, we were at a funeral and this particular person being buried, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is a good thing to do by any means. It is simply what was done, okay? This particular person was such an avid gambler, there must have been thousands of dollars in real cash and in actual casino chips in this guy's casket. So much so that it was difficult to close. Again, I'm not suggesting it's a good thing. I'm not. This was an Orthodox thing? Yes, it was. Again, I'm not saying that that's a good thing for us to do. I'm merely saying it happened. But what related to this story is we get to the cemetery. Now, various traditions are different. 
some people like to see the body laid down into the grave. Other people can't handle that. They go to the cemetery, they leave. Some people don't even go to the cemetery. So we get to the cemetery. The priest does the final trisayun. And the survivor of the person in the casket turns to the funeral director and says, okay, fill up the hole. He goes, excuse me? Yep, fill it up. What? Fill the hole. He says, ma'am, this is not the old country. I don't have two people waiting with shovels. We do this stuff with heavy equipment and tractors. He says, I know, fill up the hole. So he gets on the radio, the tractor, right? They, they lift up, if you've ever seen the concrete lid from a concrete vault, right? They lift the lid, boom, on top of it. And then, then they're filling in the dirt, and you're hearing all this, I mean, this, and then they're tamping it down, and the family is sitting there the entire time. Then it occurred to me, there's thousands of dollars in that coffin, and everybody saw it. And this is, my, this is, right, the family was being tortured by the idea that before they filled up the hole, they would desecrate that guy's coffin and remove all that, and remove all that wealth. That's how much wealth can torment us, right? Here's this family that had to endure, I mean, tractors and this and that, literally pounding on top of their loved one's grave, just because the idea of someone getting in there and taking some of that money was too much for them to bear. That's what Chris Islam is talking about, that kind of torture even in death. I'll never forget that day. It was really wild. How many people are going to be helped with that? Again, I'm not suggesting it was a good thing to have all that, but it does help us understand what Chris Dom is talking about here. I mean, look, our museums are filled with riches that come from graves. Or the Egyptians. Right? The, the Egyptians are not the only ones, right? But so there's, so Chris Tom has a point from this, but you know, the grave robbers are a little, are a little different. Okay. So this brings us now to our send off. What does Chris Tom want to lead us into our next week? This is exactly what you're talking about, Maria. Give your wealth away to defeat vainglory. But let us make this beast tame, and it will be tame if we do not shut it up, but, will, but give it to the hands of all who are in need. So shall we reap from this quarter the greatest blessings, both living in the present life with safety and a good hope, and in the day that is to come, standing with boldness. Right? So if we want peace of mind, as they say, you can't take it with you, do good with it and get rid of the wealth. And with that, I'll share one last story about a very dear woman. She was, I don't know, maybe in her 90s when she died. Very wealthy woman. You wouldn't know by the way she lived her life. But she said to me one day, she says, I just don't understand. I keep giving it away and God keeps giving it back. It was such a beautiful understanding of the things that God gives us. She goes, I just keep giving it away and he keeps giving it back. True story. This woman, and you'd never know by looking at the way she lived her life. But she was very, very generous. All right that we a little, went a little over time tonight. Forgive me, I owe you all four minutes. Until next week, God bless you. And don't forget to live a new life in Christ.
Be Transfigured is a production of Be Transfigured Ministries in cooperation with the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We depend upon your generosity to maintain our ministry. You can make a safe online donation when you visit our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org.